This morning, we will be in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. So to prepare us for this passage, I want to take us on a little journey in our minds. And what we're, we're going to go bungee jumping, okay? So my question is, has anybody in here bungee jumped before? I should explain what it is, just, okay, a few of you, just to make sure you understand. Bungee jumping is when you tie a few very tiny elastic cords to a harness around your body and jump from a very uh, large distance. That is essentially bungee jumping. But uh, I did this in college, but I want you to experience this with me, okay? So we're going to do this together. Who's excited? <laughs> Here we go. So the day arrives for our bungee jumping, and we're actually really excited about this little adventure we're going to have. So we go on a journey, and we go over to the bungee jump site. We get there, and at this point, apprehension begins to creep in because we've signed a waiver, right, liability waiver, that we won't sue if we're seriously injured or death. Um, but when we get there, what we're expecting is a nice, safe, professional establishment. What we see when we get there is a very tiny trailer, next to it a very tiny cushion, right next to that a very large crane, and at this point a very large man walks out of the tiny trailer. And the large man is like bodybuilder large, like I kid you not, painted green, looks like the Hulk large. <laughs> Here's a fun fact about this man. He, uh, hopefully this, maybe 50% of you may get this reference. Uh, he's wearing uh, MC Hammer pants, <laughs> right? And his uh, badge on his shirt says, Jump Master. Yeah. So at this point, we're not so sure we can trust the Jump Master. So um, we ask him, okay, where's the jump site? And he looks at us funny, and he goes, right here, why? And I said, well... We ask, where's the very large cushion in case something goes wrong? And he literally tells us, he goes, oh, that's just to make you feel better. No cushion will save you at that height. <laughs> I tell you, we don't feel better. We are starting to wonder, what have we signed up for? So at this point, we go over to the platform that, while well, it's still on the ground, and he begins giving us instruction, and we're listening to every word that the master says at this point because he's talking about how to safely be harnessed in and not to jump in a way that gets you tangled in your harness on the way down, uh, in your cords. So we are listening intently to the master. After he's finished with his instruction, he hits the up button on the crane and the platform begins to go up and up and up and up 20 stories high, so we're 200 feet in the air. Now, we're in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We're on a summer ministry project. So at least it's a beautiful view of like the whole ocean, right? And most of the coastline of South Carolina and some of North Carolina and probably Georgia as well. But we look down at the mat and the mat at this point from our vantage point is about that big. <laughs> and the jump master tells us that he's going to count down from 10. And when he gets to one, he's going to say go. And at that point... We jump head first. At this point, while he's counting down, we're counting the cost. Is this really worth it? So he says, go to the edge of the platform. We go to the edge. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. Who wants to jump? <laughs> By show of hands, who says yes, they want to jump? No. Who says no? Yes. Oh, the yeses have it. So we take a big breath, and we literally just fall forward. And at this point, terror is not a strong enough word to describe what happens to us in that moment. Because potentially three things are going on at the same time. Number one, we're not created for this, so our brains are convincing us that we are going to die on the way down. Number two is literal. Some of you went number two. It was so frightening. <laughs> I assure you, not me but I know some of you. <laughs> Number three, the sound that is coming out of us. We're trying to scream, but it's so terrifying we can't. The only sound is <laughs> all the way down. It's not until we get to the bottom limit, begin to recoil on our way up, which is equally terrifying, and make it halfway back up that we're able to let out a scream like a little girl. 
So why did I take us on this little journey? What does this have to do with our passage? As our journey began, it was exciting, but as it continued on, it became more and more frightening and terrifying. And I wanted you to experience this because this is the mood of the section of scripture that we're in right now in, in, in Mark's gospel, especially around chapter 10. There's an urgency. And the intensity of bungee jumping is actually nothing compared to what the disciples of Jesus experience themselves on their journey with Jesus. So for the disciples, when Jesus first called them to follow him, it was exciting. But they did not exactly understand what the master was calling them to yet and where they would be going. But it was exciting. I mean, Jesus was performing all of these miracles, right? He's teaching them these astonishing things. People are wondering, in light of his miracles, who is this man? You know, many think that he is of God, but not everyone. There's opposition that is increasing by way of the religious rulers of the day, who they think Jesus is dangerous. They actually think that he is of Satan. And so this conflict, this tension is rising. And at the perfect moment, Jesus turns to his disciples, this is Mark chapter 8, and asks, who do you say that I am? It's Peter speaking on behalf of the disciples that says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. So they get it, kind of, but actually not really. What they're expecting is a military political king that is going to conquer and overthrow Rome. But right after Peter confesses that, what Jesus has to tell the disciples, not once but twice leading up to our passage, that he himself will have to suffer and be killed in Jerusalem. What? What kind of king is this? So in our passage, what we find is there's an urgency for the disciples. And not just the disciples then, the disciples include us now. There's an urgency. Do we see Jesus clearly? Do we see what he is about, what his ministry is about? There's an urgency to listen to his instruction regarding what his kingdom is all about. And there is an urgency to count the cost of what does it look like to follow him. Now, shouldn't it have been easy for the disciples to follow Jesus? I mean, they saw all his miracles. They experienced it. They were astonished by his teaching. But what we find in the Gospels is that as the heat gets turned up, the more and more distance the disciples have between them and Jesus. And actually, I don't think that's very different from us. right? It's, it, it can be very easy to follow God when things are going well for us. But when the heat gets turned up, it can be difficult to follow closely. Because when the heat gets turned up, we become suspicious, don't we? Suspicious of God's care, his character, his plan for us. And the other challenge with following Jesus closely is so often we're bombarded by the values of the world around us and our hearts can be given to those values. But Jesus calls us to different values the values of his kingdom. So what I want to do this morning as we work through the rest of Mark chapter 10, I want us to consider two questions that I'll repeat over and over. Do we see Jesus clearly? Because the scriptures will help us to see Jesus. Do we see him clearly? And what does it look like to follow him? So let me pray for us and we will dive in. So Father, I do pray Open up our hearts, our minds to receive what you have for us this morning. Lord, for some in here, I, I, it may just be a reminder of your character, of your goodness, of the values of the kingdom. And that's good. I pray that you would reinforce it for others. There may be things that jump off the page that are new regarding your character. And for those who are not following you, I, I pray, Lord, you would convict and draw them to you. So for all of us, I pray that you would strengthen us. Convict us, encourage us with your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now let's uh, jump into our passage. That was, my, that was a cheesy pun, that was intentional. All right, so here we are, chapter 10, 
Gospel of Mark, verse 13. We're going to go section by section, 13 through 16. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Okay, so there's an important theme that we have to understand leading up to this passage that we see in this section. And it's best summarized in Mark chapter 9, verse 35, where right before this, the disciples are arguing over which one of them is the greatest. Who is the greatest among them? And what Jesus says in Mark 9, 35 he says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and a servant of all. And this is the theme that we're going to continue to see throughout the, or it's, it, we've seen it already in Mark, we'll continue to see this theme of those who are first are last and the last are first. We'll see that very theme at least two other times in this section of scripture this morning. And so this theme in the gospel of Mark is who's actually on the inside of this kingdom and who is on the outside of this kingdom? Because often those who think of themselves as great are on the outside. But those who are humble, like a child, childlike faith, those are the ones on the inside. And our passage helps us to understand why. So in the hierarchy of society back there, children were not considered the greatest. right? They were oftentimes looked over or overlooked. In our passage... The disciples are going along with the values of the culture around them. And in fact, they are keeping children from Jesus. And so Jesus, the scripture says, gets indignant, intensely angry. And why? Because the disciples are actually misrepresenting the character of God. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. To the children belong the kingdom of God. And by the way, as a church, we take this seriously. We, we saw this this morning as we gathered our church or our children up here. We believe that children of believers are actually part of the covenant family of God that was established in the Old Testament. We see throughout the New Testament part of the church. We trust that God is at work in their lives. And so we instruct them to that end. And then Jesus says this in verse 15. He says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What does that mean to receive the kingdom of God like a child? Well, let's just think about the posture of a little child towards mom and dad. It's a posture of this, right? Feed me, hold me, clothe me, hug me, protect me, read to me, watch me, be my everything. Right? That's the posture of a child. It is total dependence, desperate dependence. It is helpless. It's the posture also that Jesus says of a disciple, a childlike faith, complete trust. But it doesn't come naturally, does it? And why not? Why is childlike faith so difficult for us at times? Well, if I can just use a movie quote to capture a, a, a particular value, and I'll, I'll give a little background. So about a month ago, I went to my local gym. I wanted to do some cardio workout, ride a stationary bike, and I had two options. I have the main room where everybody gathers, or there's the movie room. And so um, I went over to the movie room just to see what was playing. And this is when I lose my man card. So, out of a moment of weakness, maybe it was curiosity, I decided to go into the movie room because the movie was Twilight, okay? <laughs> so, Twilight is the movie about a girl that starts to date a vampire, and the question is, will she become a vampire? I don't want to give it away. <laughs> but then, as the movie continues on... Um, there is, and if this helps gain my man card back a little bit, there were, at least, there were at least a few times where the dialogue made me kind of throw up in my mouth. But one of them in particular 
was when Bella, the uh, future vampire, when she looks at one of her good friends who's talking about all her boy troubles, and what she says to her is this. She says, take control. You're a strong, independent woman. And right then I thought, wow, the value of our culture in a nutshell right there. And just to be clear, don't hear what I'm not saying. This is not against women. This is actually against all of humanity. Because the same sentiment, this essentially was what we find exactly in Genesis 3, the fall of Adam and Eve. When Satan tempts them to take control and to be strong and independent apart from God. And we've been battling with this ever since. But the scriptures teach that we are to be weak. Different values of this kingdom. That when we are weak and dependent on the Lord, then we are strong. And so as disciples, what do we need to see here first with this story? How do we see Jesus clearly here? Look at his character. He is on the road to the cross. And he is angry, not because kids are bothering him, but because his disciples are keeping children from them because he longs to bless them. As it says, longs, take them in his arm, bless them, lay in his hands on them. And so what is our calling as a church and what is our calling as families? It is continually to bring our children to the Lord. And what does that look like? It does look like bringing them to church where they're a regular part, and I mean bring them to church regularly, part of the community here, needing the instruction of the world. We just have to be aware always that the world wants to lay out ways for our kids to be great in the eyes of the world. And what we need is the constant reminder Sunday after Sunday, what we want our kids to be great at is following Jesus. That's what we want our kids to be great at. So how do we do this? The instruction, we bring them to the community of the saints. We read the scriptures to them. We pray for them. And I realize as a parent, if you're like me, you go through seasons where sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's really difficult. I'm so encouraged still by the words that a professor of mine said at, uh, when I, at Covenant Seminary. He was doing a, a clinic uh, on marriage and family, and he, he named this beatitude. He's like, blessed is the man who restarts devotions. That's it. How many times in my life I've had to restart a commitment of devotion, of, of reading the scriptures, of praying for my kids, praying for the kids in our church. And what does discipleship look like for all of us? It's a childlike faith. It's desperate dependence. And again, for us, what has God given us? We are to hold our hands out and receive what God has given us. What is it? He's given us the church, the fellowship of believers. We need this every Sunday. He's given us the word. He's given us prayer. The question is, do we, in childlike faith, do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Now, I want to look at the contrast to childlike faith. It's actually in our next session or section and I believe Mark is very intentional with the next story he put right after this, right after this story about children. So let's pick up back up in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Disheartened by this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished, and he said to them, or, or, and said to him, Then who can be saved? 
Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay, so Mark says they are on this on his journey. Now, when Mark says this, this is the urgency of it. On his journey, meaning to Jerusalem. Again, the urgency of this situation. The man runs up, kneels before Jesus, and says, Good teacher, what must I do? Essentially, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to go to heaven? Okay. Now, Jesus, it's interesting here, says, Why do you call me Good. No one is good except God alone. So Jesus is beginning to test this man, meaning, okay, so you just said I'm good, but good is reserved for God alone, His, that, that attribute for God alone. So do you see clearly who I am and what does this mean for your life? But Jesus will go on to test, up, to test him. What Jesus does next is a bit shocking Now the man asks, what must I do? So Jesus responds by essentially, um, keep all the commandments. The man says, yep, I've done them. From my youth, I've kept them. I'm good to go. Jesus says, not so fast. You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have. Give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then follow me. Okay, so wait. So is this Jesus doing, is Jesus all about moralism? Just we have to do the right things to spend eternity with him? Or is this a prescription of if we want to guarantee our ticket to heaven, we just sell everything, give to the poor? Is that what Jesus is doing? And the answer is no. We need to look a bit deeper at this passage. Mark tells us that Jesus looking at him, and this idea of looking is, intently sizing him up Jesus can see right through him but Jesus loves him and so Jesus says there's just one thing but it's a huge heart level thing this one thing he asked of this man is everything to this man so let me let me do it this way if this man had a proper understanding of the law because when Jesus names some of the commandments, he's like, I've kept them perfectly. If the man had a proper understanding of the t- intent of the law, here's what he should have said, something like this. Huh, okay, Jesus, you just named some of the commandments. But, and I noticed you named the commandments, the second half of them, all about loving our neighbor as ourself. And honestly, Jesus, I failed. I failed to love my neighbor perfectly. I have murdered people in my own mind and heart out of hatred. I have committed adultery by way of lust. And Jesus, you didn't even name necessarily coveting the last commandment, but I do covet. I covet my wealth and my possessions. See, what Jesus is doing here is Jesus is the perfect cardiologist. He's a heart doctor. What he just did to this man by way of questions is he sliced open his sternum, this little graphic, reached in, he grabbed his heart, and he held his heart out to him, and he said, do you see? Do you see who's standing right in front of you? And do you see what you really love? What you really love, your real God, is your wealth. That's what Jesus just did to this man. And what did this man do? His wealth was his God, and he walked away sorrowful. This becomes a teachable moment for the disciples, as Jesus brings them together and says in verses 24 and 25, how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And so the disciples at this point are astonished because in the culture of the day, 
it would have been assumed that if you are a rich man, or that God has blessed you, that God's favor is on you. But Jesus is turning this upside down. And what does Jesus say? When they ask the question, who then can be saved? The disciples, who has any chance? Jesus says, with man, it's impossible. Because in this kingdom, you cannot earn it. You are good, not good enough of yourselves to enter into it. And for those who are proud and self-sufficient, this kingdom does not belong to them. But then Jesus says, but with God, it is possible. And what the disciples did not yet understand was that Jesus himself would make it possible. That the only, way, the only entrance into this kingdom is by way of grace. And the grace will come through Jesus. And they don't understand yet that Jesus himself will give up everything at the cross for their salvation. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Rich in grace. Rich in blessing. So what is discipleship? According to this passage, what does it look like? Uh, let me set it up with a quick story. So years ago, I get a phone call from my wife. I'm at work, and she says, and I won't name which son. I have three sons and one daughter. One of my sons, she, uh, my wife tells me, hey, he's, he's pretty, he's pretty dis disheartened, pretty discouraged. So when you come home, you should probably talk to him. I'm not sure. I mean, he's, he's little at the time. I'm not sure what awaits me. So I get home. I pull him aside, and I'm like, son, what's wrong? And he just, big sigh, head down. You could tell he's so heavy-hearted. And then he holds up a Batman figurine. It's about that big. And he says, I'm having a hard time loving Jesus more than Batman. <laughs> and I'm like, son, go to your room. <laughs> well, no. I don't remember what I said in that moment. But you know what? Here's what I should have said, something like, you know what, son? Yeah. And that is actually the first step. It's recognizing our idols. And our idols just become bigger. They go from Batman to bank accounts. Well, maybe, no, some of you, it may be Batman. I got to be careful there. Um, but they go from Batman to bank accounts and possessions and status and whatever else we want to give us security in this world. But Jesus is a cardiologist, and he's a jealous cardiologist. What he desires to do is heart surgery on all of us, to root out the idols in our life, because he knows they are destructive to our lives. They will not bring us eternal life, and they cannot bring us fulfilling joy. There's a quote by a man once who, uh, he, he took a tour of a castle and all its beautiful grounds. And he made a comment that, uh, he says this, these are the things that make it difficult for one to die. Right? And that's the problem with idols, is they tether our hearts to this world and the longings of this world. And scripture puts a special emphasis on our money and our possessions. And what did Jesus say about it? Jesus talked about our, our riches being, uh, or being deceived by riches and that we can't serve God and money. And so maybe a good test for us, if I can give us one test, would be this. Is it difficult for you to give generously, to give financially? And if so, it's probably good to do some heart work and trace that back of what does your discipleship to the Lord actually look like? What are you trusting in? And do you trust the Lord with every aspect of your life? We do find in this passage an encouragement, but then followed by a warning. The encouragement is this. Peter's wondering, have we followed you in vain, Lord? Is all this in vain? And Jesus assures him, no. You will receive a hundredfold in this life and the one to come for those who forsake everything and follow me. 
right? But then there's this warning. But it will come with persecution. We have to have that reminder that in this life, we should expect persecution and suffering. It's part of the deal until Jesus returns to make all things new. And then it ends in verse 31 with this statement. But many who are first will be last, meaning the rich young man, and the last will be first, meaning those who cling to God with a childlike faith. Now the disciples are amazed, and their amazement uh, will continue in this next section, verses 32 through 34. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes. They will condemn him to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. After three days, he will rise again. Do you notice what Mark did initially? And on the road, right, Going to Jerusalem, Mark names the place that they were going, Jerusalem. And what awaits him in Jerusalem? It's the cross. The urgency of the situation is increasing. And notice the details here. Authors in the Bible never put in details just because they were, you know, had extra time on their hands, right? It says the disciples were amazed and those who followed, those in the crowd, uh, were afraid. So what's going on? Now, Jesus had already pulled his disciples aside twice and said when he goes in Jerusalem, he must suffer and be killed. And so the disciples' amazement probably has something to do with the determination as Jesus is leading out ahead of them on the way to Jerusalem. But the crowd is afraid. And why? Likely that following Jesus at this point in his ministry is incredibly risky. But there's also likely something else that's going on here. It's the look on Jesus' face. If I can say this, what Jesus is about to fulfill and experience uh, was the prophecy all over the Old Testament, especially Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. The amazement may be the look on Jesus' face, his determination, his face set like flint to go to Jerusalem. Why? To go to the cross for the salvation of his people. For this third and last time, Jesus tells the 12 what will happen to the Son of Man. In this phrase, Son of Man, Jesus used it often of himself. Twofold. One, Son of Man, he fully human, but the second part of that, but he's fully God. And he is the fulfillment of Daniel 7. That the Lord will return, the Messiah will come, and he will be exalted to glory and majesty. He will have an everlasting kingdom, but before that comes... He will be humiliated by way of the cross. And Jesus predicts it perfectly. He was, we will see, delivered to the religious rulers of the day, the the, the scribes and the priests. And then they condemned him to death. And then he was delivered to the Gentiles, namely Pontius Pilate. Jesus was mocked, spit on, he was flogged, crucified. But his prediction After three days, he'll rise. But we have to see here, the one who is the greatest will be counted and considered as the least for his disciples. And how do the disciples respond? Let's look at verses 35 through 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, We are able. 
Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I'm baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentile lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So James and John, these are brothers with the nickname Sons of Thunder. And we're about to find out why, like with their audacious question for Jesus. Say, teacher, do for us whatever we ask. Now, I've tried this in marriage a few times where I'm like, hey, Tiffany, got a question for you, but just trust me and say yes. She's like, well, let's hear the question, right? Which makes sense. This is, Jesus responds, what do you want me to do for you? Now, he knows, but he needs them to name it. And their answer essentially is this, we want glory. That's what we want. We want to sit on your right and your left, the places of honor in your kingdom. We want glory. And Jesus says, well, have you considered the cup and the baptism? And by cup, what Jesus is referring to is the cup of wrath that we see throughout the Old Testament. The cup that is reserved for the nations that are in rebellion against God. But that's the cup that Jesus will drink for his disciples He will take on the wrath of God. He will drink the cup, every last drop for his people. And then as Jesus is talking about the baptism, it's most likely a reference to being overwhelmed by the flood of judgment that is brought on by God. Psalm 88.7 says it this way, Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. So Jesus says, can you take on the cup and the baptism? Like we're, their response is we're able. They don't fully understand what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus assures them this will be their fate, a cup and baptism. But in this sense, that they will suffer. James will be killed with the sword in Acts chapter 12. And in Revelation 1.9, we know that John himself was banished out of persecution to the island of Patmos. But Jesus goes on to say, but as far as my right and my left, that's, that is for God, God the Father, to uh, reward. So the disciples catch wind of this conversation. They're furious. And why? Because they wanted those spots of greatness. They've already been arguing over who is the greatest. And so there's another urgent, teachable moment for the disciples here when Jesus tells them, you are not to play by the rules of the world. And then this glorious statement that's made. Many look to this as the theme of Mark, right, of the theme verse. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. My question is, do we see Jesus clearly here? The Apostle John will say in his gospel, no greater love than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus in a few days will lay down his life for his friends, John and James. Jesus will himself become the ransom. And this idea of ransom is the idea of paying a debt to release a slave. And so what is on Jesus' mind as he's entering into Jerusalem is that he is the ransom So what's on his mind? In one word, we could say it's the cross. Let's go two words. Let's go substitutionary atonement. What is substitutionary atonement? Because it is so near and dear to our faith. Let's break that down. Atonement. Atonement is this this understanding that sin has to be dealt with. It has to be removed in order for us to be reconciled with God, in order for us to avoid the very judgment and wrath that God has stored up against sin. That's atonement. Substitute. Substitutionary atonement. 
Let me just play this out um, with a picture. Here it is. A day is coming where we will all stand before the Lord in judgment. And on that day, and, I, and, and I'm not suggesting this is exactly how, I'm gonna, how it's going to play out, so just give me some liberty here. Okay. But just imagine on that day we stand before God the Father, and he says, are you worthy to enter into my perfect heaven, my perfection, my holiness? Are you perfect? Have you obeyed me? If you obeyed everything, all the commandments, are you worthy? And at that point, we have to recognize, no, we fail to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We fail to love our neighbor as ourself. So the only thing we can do in that moment is hang our head and say no. But right at that moment, it is Jesus that stands alongside of us and says, actually, this one is worthy. And here's why. I'm his substitute. I live the perfect life that he could not live, making me the perfect sacrifice. And I died for him. My blood shed for him. My blood cleansing all his sin. So my righteousness, Father, transferred to this sinner. His sin transferred to me. I am his substitute. So is he worthy to enter in? Yes, because of my blood. And that's the only way to enter in to this kingdom of God. And do we see the beauty of Christ and his work for us? What does it look like to follow Jesus? Amazement? As we're reminded of these glorious truths, are we amazed by the grace of God? And do we do look different than the world? The world is about chasing fame and money and status and so many things and desiring glory, but that's not what this kingdom is about. So let's look at one last story to end. And this is what the story really is about. Um, I believe that this last section is uh, Mark kind of dropping the mic of his gospel and, and walking away and then coming back uh, to write chapters 11 and on. But it's a significant summary. So let's take up verses 40, uh, 46. It's a summary of what, we have been, uh, what the scriptures have been teaching and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up, came to Jesus. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. So think about this story. Jericho is about 15 miles from Jerusalem. So they're on the way to Jerusalem. And Mark includes this account of a blind man named Bartimaeus. Remember the theme throughout Mark. Who's on the inside and who's on the outside? Who sees Jesus clearly and follows and who doesn't? So imagine the scene, Bartimaeus on the side of the road. He's marginalized because he's blind and he's a beggar. That would have been looked down, to, looked down upon in that culture. And then there's this stir in the crowd. Surely somebody yells out something like, it's Jesus, right? And the crowd is following Jesus. And so what does blind Bartimaeus do? He calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd essentially tells him to shut up. Why? Probably because of his lowly condition. Could it be that he used the term son of David, which has political ramifications? But what does Bartimaeus do? He is desperate, cries out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. The son of David, this term, this is what they were waiting for, God's people. They were waiting for the true king to return, to bring blessing and healing and restoration. They're waiting for this. So this is an image of the Messiah. And Bartimaeus is saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Jesus calls him, says, what do you want me to do for you? The exact same question he asked James and John. Remember their response? We want glory. But what does blind Bartimaeus want? He wants his sight. He believes that Jesus can do this miracle and heal him. And this is just, it just points to a greater truth from Joel chapter 2, verse 32. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus says, go your way, your faith has made you well. This is Jesus' last healing before he enters in to that last week of his life. Immediately, he recovered his sight. Bartimaeus did and followed him on the way. Some believe that Bartimaeus probably, and I'm in this camp, Bartimaeus probably was a disciple because he followed Jesus on the way, and his name is remembered. So likely part of the early church. So here's the question for us, and we'll, we'll end with this. Is Jesus worth following wholeheartedly? And do we see him clearly? Jesus is the glorious son of David. He is the exalted king. He is the eternal king that the Old Testament pointed to. Revelation calls him the faithful and true king of kings and lord of lords. And what do we see? We see a king who took on flesh for us and went the way of the cross to pay as our ransom. We see a God whose his face was set like flint, determined to rescue us. And why? Hebrews tells us for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy? It was obedience to the Father, but it was also the rescuing of his people. That was his joy. And he's a God who stops for those who call on his name. No matter what we are facing, think about his character in the story. God is a God who stops for his children. So what does following look like? It looks like blind Bartimaeus trusting in Jesus in childlike faith. It also looks like, think about what blind Bartimaeus did. When Jesus called him, he threw aside his cloak and sprang to Jesus. That cloak was probably his only possession. Bartimaeus essentially left everything behind, understanding that his treasure was in front of him. That's the call of discipleship. The question is, what stands in our way from our Lord? For you personally, anything come to your mind? What stands in the way of you following Jesus more closely? I'll leave us with Jesus' words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see you clearly, that we would see you as our glorious king, one who paid our ransom to set us free. And I pray that that freedom would be freedom to follow you wholeheartedly, that we would see that you are our treasure, that you'd be at work in our lives, rooting out our lesser treasures, the things of this world that keep our hearts and our minds on this world. So help us to look to you. Thank you for the glorious truth of the gospel that you, recon you, you have reconciled us to you. You've called us to follow you. So I do pray that you would help us to walk in your ways. I pray for our children in our congregation, that, Lord, you would bless them, that they would walk in your ways all the days of their lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.